thank you all for coming for this second artist talk for Source of Light. We've got a great crowd here and we're going to have the artists who are here to speak, talk a few minutes about their work as we huddle around with our floating heads and hands. And um, we have the first piece over here is called Under Your Spotlight. And this is Jaina. I, I know I'm going to mess your last name up. Do you want to Cipriano. say it? <laughs> yeah. It is Jaina Cipriano. I'm Jaina okay. Cipriano. Hi. Awesome. Take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Jaina Cipriano. Uh, the photo that's here is a self-portrait. And I often work in self-portraiture inside of worlds that I build myself. So I can I can talk about the work, but I think the most interesting part of it for me is the transformation that happens inside of myself rather than the end result. The end result, like creating a photograph and having a piece of artwork is just a nice bonus. When I'm inside these sets, it is this evolving playground where I kind of, it's a communication between like myself and the external world. I'm really interested in the concept of how space affects our internal lives. That's really central to my process. I think that fabricated spaces and events have this like kind of theatricality that thrills me. And I think, I mean, there's, there's so much talk in photography about, about like truth in image making, but for me, I don't think there's any greater truth than when a fabricated image feels more real than reality as if looking through someone and into their own emotional landscape. I think that work like that can really connect us and remind us that we're not ever alone in the intensity of our emotions. When I work and create these worlds, it's almost always a way of working to change my internal narrative and the stories that I'm telling myself. So when I find things are not going the way that I want them to in my life, I go to photography and use that kind of as a little bit of psycho magic. I create these spaces so that I have like a safe space to open up and be present and trust the process because those are things that I find really difficult to do in the world. <laughs> so it's like a kind of like a trial run of practicing a, a life philosophy that I would love to apply to my real life. Mm. Um, I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian cult and was kept really separate from the world, both physically and emotionally. And so looking through the viewfinder of a camera was a way for me to embrace that separation. And it was a way for me to make it work for me rather than against me. The camera gave me a purpose and it was a reason to be somewhere and to talk to people. And so using the lens, I was able to reintegrate myself back into the world. But when I create these spaces and I create these works, they put me in new pockets of my mind and they connect me to who I am, to like who I truly am without the heavy influence of my past. And the more that I create these works, the more it becomes clear that I'm mapping the darkness of my psyche and, and illuminating new areas and eliminating fear. So growing up in this cult kept me inside of a vacuum without human interaction. And the only thing I really had was space. So I play pretend a lot as a kid. And now I'm able to build my own spaces and they're able to reflect my inner state and make me feel safe. And so that's that's really what I do it for. And, and I and I think that really what I yeah, really what I do it for is is I put a piece of myself into these photos so that it can be a mirror to anyone else's darkness and, and they can feel less alone. I think if we can't see ourselves reflected back to us in the world around us, how can we figure out who we truly are? And media and art have been a way for me to figure that out when I didn't have a, a connection to the world around me. And so it's really how I, I try and communicate back to the world now as an adult. So thank you. Thank you for, for, for being my work and for listening. Wow, thank you, Jana. Uh, really, really compelling. Um, both the piece on its own and the, the reason you know, the reasons you create these spaces. And um, yeah, I'd, I have to see more of what you do because it is, it's so, it's so cool. Like, it, are there a whole series from this day when you did the shoot or was this a singular? That, that one is just a singular one. Mm -hmm. But once, once I, once the pandemic happened, really self-portraiture was the only thing I 
So the last like three mm. years is there's a couple series of self portraits. Yeah. Wow. Um, and just real quick, um, if anybody, if, if you guys want to mute your, um, <laughs> your cameras, I think we have some kitchen noises going on. Um, you can just do that by hitting um, tab and then settings and then mute self. They were unable to do I that. Don't think I, I don't think I'm in the right room. I'm not looking at the right pictures. Oh, who's speaking? Vicky. Oh, Vicky. Yeah, everybody's here, but. Oh, okay. So, right okay. So, if you want to walk through the door, um, it's like it's a map space, so it, it is identical. But um, if you walk through the, the door where it says the show name, um, okay. Uh, Plum Gallery, walk through there and then you'll see us. Oh, she just left. I, she was with us. Yeah, so she was going to come back through the front door. It's going to be funny. Or it'll be a little strange, but you'll see her come through in a moment and she should be able to see us. Because um, there's two different rooms with the artwork. So, um, but yeah, while, while we wait for her to join, did anyone else oh, I want to make a comment or uh, have a question? Yeah, I didn't. Um, Jaina, this is Chris Demore. I didn't realize you were in this show too, but I think we were in a zine together a couple of years ago, um, oh, cool. which is actually where I, where I found your work first and have been following online since. But I mean, this photo is awesome, but it doesn't even scratch the surface of like the intense prop and set work that you've built over the years and I think everyone should take a look at it it's really impressive it's just it's like you said it's just a kind of a an internal representation of your your journey and in, in self-exploration and um just it, it just goes really deep and it's just impressive from a from a building standpoint um mm. and I don't it seems like you might have like a crew of people that help you out on a regular basis or I do my best. I, I do my best to find people, but sometimes it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's really it's really awesome. I really like following along and it's always surprising and different. And oh thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to see you here. It's good to see you again. And and what is your camera of choice? My camera of choice is a Nikon D eight fifty, the twenty four cool. to seventy. Amazing. And and Victoria, are you seeing a, a photo uh, now? Not, yeah, I can see it With now. the spotlight. Oh, good. Sorry about that. No um, okay, great. Well, for time's sake, because we have a lot of artists here, um, if if anyone else, um, you know, has a, um, a comment or a question, I would encourage you all. Um, I just posted on a plum the on Instagram and I tagged all of you. So if you're wondering how to find each other, that might be a good way. Um, and I agree. It's, it's, it's always nice in the group shows. It's like an entryway into everyone's work, but um, it's fun to also see what else they, they output. So hopefully you guys can connect that way. Um, you have a very powerful photograph though. Mm -hmm. It's really very strong in the show and online as well. Looks really nice. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. Um, so I, is Kylie here? I don't think I've seen her floating around. Um, so I think what, we'll move on to Carrie Nixon. And if Kylie shows up later, we'll go back to it. Um, Carrie, are you here? Let's see. She was here. Oh, Carrie, I see you over here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, looking for Carrie, though. All right. Let's come back to Carrie. She may have stepped away. Um, well, Susan. Oh, Susan couldn't be here. She had, um, she had some thing come up. Uh, Chris, would you? Would you like to talk about your photograph? Sure. Awesome. So over here, 
His photo is called Laura Stevenson, and this is Chris D'Amore. All right. Um, I went super literal on this one when I saw the open call. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, what do I have? What do I have? And this, I think this image is uh, 20, 2015. Um, so it's a bit old, but it, it just popped into my mind right away because of um, the stark image on the black background. But um, so my journey in photography started in high school. I took a film class and um, was hooked ever since. But around the time that I graduated is when like the DSLRs became a popular thing. And this is like 2006, I guess. Um, throughout college, I kind of got into concert photography and um, it was almost kind of like an arms race <laughs> over the years where people kept getting these insane cameras and these lenses and and every year you had to upgrade to make them better and better and better um i kind of fell away from the concert photography for a while but then in about 2010 i i made this switch over to film exclusively for everything um so that's when i kind of tried to challenge myself to bring those those older tools into that setting again um which is a bit more of a tricky thing to handle because you don't have an ability to change ISO on the fly. Um, it's just a little bit more work to get something useful, especially when you don't have control over the lighting too. Um, so I can definitely say when I took the, the camera that I did to show, it was kind of a, a weird thing to see in the crowd. And pretty much every shot I took was unusable, except for this one that just magically happened to work. Um, everything else was blurry or out of focus or the light just wasn't quite right. And, um, sometimes that's all it is, is just like taking the camera with you and getting lucky, just taking enough shots to see if you get something out of it. Um, I like film for a few reasons, but one interesting thing is that you don't, you don't know when you go home at the end of the day, what you have, mm. uh, until it, you know, gets developed and comes back. But, um, this photo was taken at the Sinclair in Cambridge and um, the venue itself was just awesome. Usually they do a pretty good job of uh, getting whatever artist is on stage with um, the lighting and how everything looks. This just happened to be Laura Stevenson's solo. They basically had one spotlight on her and I was lucky enough that the angle it was taken, everything in the wings was completely dark. So it almost gives the impression like there's this black backdrop that was purposely put there for this photo but um you know everything dark back there was dark enough that it could just kind of appear that way um yeah mm. great musician great venue and um just being in the right place at the right time thank you chris uh it really is magical that you you ended up with just one shot um, and it could almost, you can almost hear her, like you are just ready to hear her when you see the, when you see the piece. Hmm. Um, and I'm so glad that you thought to submit for the theme because it is perfect. <laughs> Did anyone have any comments or questions? Do you always work in black and white? Uh, it's kind of 50, 50 nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. I always try to i mean color is so enticing for me because i have a couple of film stocks that i really enjoy um the colors of and the, the tones of but i think it's kind of a, a self-challenge to pay attention to composition in black and white because you're not relying on um the flashiness of it necessarily yeah, I think maybe color would have been very distracting. It really works as a black and white quite well. Yeah, especially in a venue like this where a lot of the lighting is is LED based and can be a lot of mixed colors at the same yeah. time. So who knows? It could have been like purple at the time. I don't actually remember, but um, rendered in black and white, it just it looks like one spotlight or a couple. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thanks. All right. So, Peter, are you are you ready to talk about your piece? I'm, no, I'm I'm still here. Yeah, sure. Great. Um. Okay. 
Let's see if try try and locate. There it is. All right. Yeah, we're right. Weather we don't, don't, don't have know. to go okay. far. <laughs> what? I said we didn't have to go far. Uh, Peter's no, is right here. No, now you had to go all about what eight feet. If it's depending yeah. upon how you, I mean, everything is is yeah. You didn't have to go <laughs> very far at all. Yeah. Um. I think I had originally told, spoke to you, Danielle, a while ago, is that the main reason why I was applying is that I sort of looked at myself as a painter of light, going all the way back to grad school, which is quite a, quite a while ago at this point. And um, really every painting I do, um, light is really instrumental in creating the piece, composing the piece. Um, most of the time I'm using multiple light sources. This one is kind of indicative of that. Um, there is also in this one, oh, it's funny because a couple of the other people, well, let's see, I guess it was Jane had talked before. I basically, since COVID, so going back to 20, almost with a couple of sections, everything I've done have been sort of self-portrait based for kind of obvious reasons. You always have for yourself and other models or difficult to get a hold of. Um, there's also um, these subliminal narratives that creep through pretty much everything I do. They're layered. They're not necessarily conscious. I sort of draw, move things around and things sort of, I draw a charcoal on the canvas and I'm, I sort of move things around and when they sort of resolve themselves, I really start to paint. Um, and a lot of the messages that are there aren't necessarily conscious messages either. And it's interesting to see how people read into what I may or may not be doing. Um, but, you know, I, I really like things to be really highly dramatic. Um, they're obviously very theatrical. And I the, the, the self-portrait pieces are, I look at them now very recently as being sort of self caricatures in a lot of ways. I mean, I don't know whether I spoke to people at your gallery space or not, but if when you're doing yourself, you can get away with doing things you wouldn't dare do to anybody else. Um, <laughs> at least that's the way I look at it. You know, I, I could take, I mean, I don't really take license with myself, but I could be as brutal as I want to be and nobody's going to really, you know, nobody can really get offended. Um, so I don't know sure what to say beyond that. A uh, humor is a very big piece. I sort mm -hmm. of, um, you know, I think of, you know, self, you know, I, I look a lot of ways. I think of, you know, the the drawings of Domia going back to what the eighteen twenties. Um, I don't really look at myself as sort of a caricature in a physical sense, but I do like to take liberties in certain kinds of distortion. Even if you look at the painting and see, I sort of have the two door frames going down as wedges. That's not. That's quite deliberate. And um, I will move things around to get the most dramatic impact um, I possibly can. Um, I don't like doing anything sort of half-baked or watered down. It's just not what I'm about. Um, it's really what to say beyond that. That the, um, I, that's actually part of the space where I actually do live. I do have a flock of guests parrots that I do live with and paint. Um, just for a funny little anecdote, the, the, the little gold that called my shoulder I've had for 30 plus years already. That's how old the bird is. Wow. Um, I couldn't get her to stay still, so I really just threw it and moved around until I got something that I thought would work, and luckily it sort of did. But that was problematic for a little while. Um, you know, I live in a space where I have very high ceilings, which allow me to do all kinds of things I wouldn't do, be able to do in a different kind of context. Mm. And um, I really like very deep saturated color as kind of a I'm not sure what I'll say beyond that. <laughs> That's okay. I Well, I'm really glad to see people coming up to it now, because I was going to say, um, feel free to come right up, because there's a lot of detail that, that um, you can get. If you, how, Diane, how do I get closer to it? I mean, I'm not through this. Uh, yeah, you Normally can I... use your arrow keys. Oh, the arrow keys will do that also. Okay. Yeah, just move right over to the piece, and you can use your mouse to look up and down. Okay. No, I just lost it. All right. That's fine. <laughs> Did anyone have uh, comments or questions for Peter? <laughs> um, I really like the uh, 
composition. It, it's almost like Thank a you. very realistic feeling, like you're hiding in the corner, they're looking in at you, uh, and you're not aware of it. Well, there's a kind of um, almost like rear window voyeuristic. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't like, I don't really like that term because it has all kinds of implications where I really don't go. But um, that is really pretty intentional. I used to do a lot of paintings of door frames within door frames. I used to play with staircases, people going up and down them. Um, I like the idea of looking from one space into another space. I find that for me, that's really kind of, you know, really kind of fascinating and kind of really important. Um, I'm not sure what I'll say beyond that, but that, that, that kind of, um, drama that I can get through, you know, odd angles, or whatever is pretty important for me. Well, maybe, maybe, you know, you're right. For your issue, probably is the right word. It's more of almost inviting, like there's an open, you know, like a pathway to come in. Yes, absolutely. 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 Mm -hmm. um, oh and it's part of the... I love how much time... Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say, I love how much time it demands of the viewer. Like, the longer you look at it, the more you see. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Um, it's funny about the way they sort of evolve... Um, you know, you work on them and then you find you need one thing here or one mm -hmm. thing there. There was originally the, the door frame myself, the space behind it. And just for clarification, people were at the opening. Um, a couple people were saying they thought that you were looking out into a city. Though I actually live with very large Victorian piece of furniture that really mm -hmm. go up about eight, nine feet tall. So just for mm. clarification, if anybody here um, this evening is thinking <laughs> you're looking out into an outside world, you're looking only into an inside space. Mm. Um, because I, you know, I live with these things. And to me, that's my world. But you know, that kind of 100 year old furniture and trappings are not the kind of things that most people stumble into on a daily basis. But I live with it. So for mm. me, it's just like normal for people that are probably not sure what necessarily to do with it. <laughs> but um, anyway, for whatever. Um, I also, for whatever it's worth, I, I do all my paintings on medium value tone ground. Um, mm. It allows yeah. me to get the light and dark contrast happening really pretty quickly. Um, mm. And I can get a painting activated within a couple hours or they may go on for a long period of time. But I can get space operating really quickly for me, which is kind of a critical element. Mm. I, I I really haven't used white canvases in years. I mean, I may use one for demo because I used to do a lot of portrait demos. But um, for my own work, I want the mood stage as quickly as possible. I want atmosphere set up as, rip, as really rapidly as I can. And that allows me to do everything else that I sort of do. Do you if ever leave any of that showing or everything is painted, right? Well, I, you can see, you, I mean, if you were to look at the painting in, in your gallery right now, uh, Danielle, yeah. you can see the green coming all the way around. So nothing is really concealed. Mm. I mean, what I do is I actually use a rag yep. and um, I actually like that one. Most, I've been using chromium green oxide for years because mm. to me it works as a kind of color vibration thing. And um, I literally, I really wipe the whole canvas surface with that. So the white is gone within two or three minutes when I prepare it. Mm. And then when it dries, I just start sketching out a charcoal and balancing my lights mm. and darks and color against it. But the white is the, I will bring, I bring the light back. Mm. The light actually sits on top of the ground, but it looks like it's also backlit, but it actually isn't. Mm. Really fascinating. Yeah, but that's, it's not, it's not a method with me. I mean, it's, it goes all the way back to, you know, the 15, 1600s. I mm -hmm. mean, they may have, the old master may have worked in soupy brown grounds, but the concept is really the same. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, yeah. I use an underpainting mm -hmm. as well. I think I was sure. thinking, I was thinking you said your actual canvas was neutral tone. But you mean you? No, no, it's okay. not. Well, I, mean, I don't think I wouldn't call the green neutral. I mean, yeah, yeah. It may be it may be like a forty percent gray on a scale of light to dark. Yeah. But it's um. Okay. I wouldn't. Got it. I, yeah, I, I know I, what you mean. It's now. not gray. It's yeah. definitely not gray, which is okay. what I would call neutral at all. Yeah, yeah. sure. 
Very cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for speaking about it. Um, did anyone else have questions or should we um, move along? Um, I have a quick one. Mm, sure. I think about this a lot um, in music, photography, other pursuits, but taking your work seriously, which is obviously a labor of love here, um, just how well you've... Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I take it very, very seriously. Yeah. But also approaching it with a self-effacing kind of jokey attitude. There's kind of yeah. Well, thank you. That's I. You know, it's funny. I'm not a. I'm not a youngster, and um, that may be part of the way I look at it that way. I mean, I actually jokingly call myself an old fart, and I, you know, I, I don't have any problem doing that. I mean, I, I, I'm jokingly tell people I get to get another twenty, thirty years of my body if I'm allowed to, but the point being, at my stage, of the game it is what it is, and you milk it for any which way you can, and. Um, it, is, it sounds ironic to people who might be considerably younger, but I actually take pleasure in able to play with things you would not be able to do with a younger face, if that makes, if that makes any sense. I mean, I, I candor, tongue-in-cheek, any way you want to take that, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. Huh. You know, yeah, I'm drawn, yeah. drawn to works that, you know, where it's clear that decades of, of practice and consistent um, work have gone into creating something like that, but at the same time, um, it's not a, it's not a serious, not always a serious, um, for the, for the artists looking in on themselves. Hmm. Well, there's a real tongue issue. You, I, I mean, I have, I, I, in a funny way, maybe it's because I, I proceed with this. I have at this point, me is problematic for an artist to a self portrait where the easel is on one side at like a, at a, you know, like at a, let's say it pitched at a 30, 40 degree angle and they're standing there with their palette and their paintbrush. To me, that's just nothing I would want to go near. It's just mm -hmm. not the kind of self work. I mean, I've done those. I wouldn't touch one of those now probably with a 30 foot pole. But I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're like they're, you know, they're never smiling. They're deadly serious. You know, you've seen you've, lots of people do the same thing with their own light design. It's just, you know, it's not something I necessarily would want to engage at this point. I don't know how, whatever that may have sounded like. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Peter. Sure. All right. Uh, John, are you still here with us? Yes. Awesome. So let's move on. Uh, don't go through the doorway, anyone. <laughs> oh, cool. Allie's here. Hey. Okay. Hey, Allie. Okay, so okay, Neil, sorry, I muted myself. Oh, <laughs> no worries. That is that is the thing to do for the ambient noise. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, it's nice to nice to see you. You have some people. It's really cool. I love it. Yeah, it's a good group. Uh huh. All right, so we're about to um about to talk about um John Deep House's work. This is a photograph called Ambiguity, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Um, this is probably the best or maybe my favorite uh, photo that I've taken in the last year or so. Um, you know, as a, as a photographer, I, um, I tend to get in a, um, a zone where I'm really not conscious of what I'm shooting. Um, and I don't know actually what I've captured until I get home and, and really start going through uh, the images. Uh, over the last couple of years, one of the uh, settings that I've, I've done a lot of uh, character studies uh, are in uh, Civil War reenactments uh, around, mm -hmm. uh, I live in mid-Michigan, and there's uh, apparently a very active reenactor community uh, mm -hmm. in, in Michigan. So there are multiple uh, you know, weekend reenactments um, which has yielded uh, just an amazing pool of, of interesting faces, moods, um, stories within stories that um, are kind of unexpected. Um, I guess if, if you think about it, reenactors are actors. Uh, they're playing a role. They're they're becoming a character. But what has been most 
uh, interesting to me and what's what's been most productive is there are in any re reenacting community uh, it's a family activity and they often bring uh, very young children dressed in in character uh, who take on uh, a, a persona apparently right out of the 1860s um, that um, trans transcends uh, the setting in some ways. Uh, this, this photo was one of a series that I took of this young person um, and there's probably three or four others in this series that are, I think, equally strong, but this is one that, uh, as I was processing, really uh, kind of seemed to come together. Uh, I titled it Ambiguity because it, it seems to fit on a variety of, uh, variety of levels, both uh, tangible, concretely, uh, and also symbolically, abstractly. Uh, the most obvious, uh, it's really not clear what this young person is is doing other than they have uh, a bite of food in their hand. Uh, what they're feeling uh, is very open to interpretation. I, um, I looked at the other, uh, the shots that were I, that I took before and after this, and the expression that came across was uh, incredibly undefinable. Uh, <laughs> the, they weren't happy, unhappy, quizzical, uh, bored. Um, they were there, and you can read into the image uh, a variety of of moods, emotions, uh, thoughts. Um, I thought when I first took this that this was, was a very young girl, uh, probably six, seven, eight years old. Uh, and when I looked at the, the other shots in this series, I'm not, to, to this day, I'm not sure the, what the gender of the person is. Uh, which helped uh, define the title of ambiguity. Uh, to me, it seems like a, an absolute study in uncertainty, lack of clarity, uh, and yet a riveting uh, uh, stare that um, every time I look at it, I think something slightly different of what this young person must have been thinking at the time. Thank you, John. It's really interesting to hear you explain. Um, I was a little unsure of what, like <laughs> how we'd come across a person dressed like this as well. And it, it's really interesting, the idea of having children at reenactments. Um, I've got a five-year-old myself and I can't imagine explaining uh, <laughs> the i don't know what's required to be part of that but yeah the 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 gaze there it does seem it seems beyond their years too and i don't know how aware of they were of you are you close up or this you have a zoom lens uh taken with a zoom lens often they are uh they're really kind of oblivious uh, most of the, the young people i take are probably less than than ten, and mm -hmm. they're just they're running around, they're playing, they're they're being, you know, six year olds, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's very much uh, serendipity of, of the the re images that result. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're very aware. Uh, this this summer, uh, I went to three different reenactments. And there was a very, a very young man, probably five or six years old, uh, dressed in uniform, uh, who was a very serious young man. Mm. Uh, and I chased him across all three um, 
reenactments, and he really did not want his picture taken. Um, he he scowled, uh, turned his head. He was very aware of my presence, mm -hmm. uh, and it was only in the third reenactment that I think I caught him off guard. Uh, and the result is an image that actually looks very much like uh, uh, a historic 1960s young soldier, soldier on his way to war, uh, uh, which I have titled uh, Too Soon a Soldier. Um, but most of the time, they're, they're kind of oblivious um, to what is going on around them, other than just playing with their friends, mm -hmm. um, being kind of in the moment, and yet, you know, dressed in, in character has mm -hmm. got to add a dimension to it that uh, takes, takes them out of, you know, 2023 and transports them to somewhere else. Right. Oh, sorry, one second. If somebody, if anybody's um, got some background noise, maybe you could mute. <laughs> Sounds like some sweeping or something. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's interesting out of the works we've talked about tonight that there's been a lot of performance involved. <laughs> and um, I imagine that people are expecting there to be cameras at something like this, too. So you have that going for you. <laughs> there, There is always um, a handful of photographers mm -hmm. uh, making the rounds. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not hard to be kind of unobtrusive uh, because these are public events. There are, are crowds kind of wandering through their campsites. Uh, they're they're often the adults are are acting as uh, almost like docents in a museum. Yeah, uh, e e explaining uh, uh, camp life, explaining the details. Of Long pose. It's a two-hour pose. And uh, taken in 20 minutes with a you know, five or 10 minute break. So it, it's difficult. I don't know if anybody's ever sat for it. It, it's not easy at all. And often some of the models can't do it. I mean, they just never really so good at doing it. He was actually too good. Um, so you have to kind of get that. Uh, lightness of expression at the very beginning, because as time wears on, the mouth droops, the eyes droop, everything kind of droops, and you, it's not a very attractive portrait. So you have to sort of get that personality at the very beginning when they're fresh. Mm. Hard to do. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of, oh, what did I sign up for? <laughs> <Going on. Yeah. laughs> But no, I, I, I like how you how you say that, like, especially it feels intimate, but it does feel like we're, like there's a separation too. like we're not quite invited in to what he's thinking and that that he's he seems like he is in thought. And I suppose when you're sitting there by yourself, you know, well, not by yourself, but you're you're meant to sit there for that amount of time your mind must wander you have, you have got to entertain yourself somehow so i wonder what it is he's thinking about yeah it, it's not easy to do that mm. it's a tough thing but um yeah there are a lot of the models who are really quite good and and can keep a good expression mm. but yeah it's kind of a medit you almost have to meditate while you're sitting there yeah well really nice thank you for uh you. for speaking about the piece and is um, is Caroline still here? Among, among all the heads? I see you, Caroline, but maybe you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so again, right next door. Um, so this is Lights Out by Caroline Gates. So I will hand it over. Yeah, I think, where to begin? I typically work in a series of obsessions, so I will paint the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and particularly during COVID, um, when we were all by ourselves and spending a lot of time 
at least for me, I was spending a lot of time in a very sparse uh, apartment in New York. So I was staring at the walls a lot and staring at um, out the window and, and just watching as the light would crawl across the wall. Um, and I became really interested in um, the single light switch on the wall and how I could so quickly change the atmosphere in the room, whether the light was on or the light was off. Uh, so I, I began this exploration of light switches and I also became that crazy person that was going around and taking pictures of everyone's light switches and sketching them. And, um, but I, I was so fascinated with how much power we had uh, with such a tiny thing that we take for granted. Mm. Um, and I typically prefer to look at things that are um, simple or sparse and that are everyday, uh, the mundane, mm. um, and then really reevaluating them and um, what a big role they play in our lives. Um, I also typically look at uh, fragments of body parts or or fragments of stories um so here we see just a, a single hand doing an action we don't know what the person looks like why they're turning off the lights maybe it's the end of the day and they're tired or maybe uh, maybe it's just time to go to another room um but i like the idea that we only see fragments of other people and we only show other people fragments of who we are um mm -hmm. and i like to reflect that in each of the pieces that i create this uh, very literally, and I was really excited when I saw that Source of Light was going to be um, the theme of this show. And so, yeah, that's basically what I what I have. Excellent, thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, people were very pleased to see your piece, and the in person too. You can tell the, uh, or you can tell if you walk up close. You guys should do it. But the tip of the light switch is really thick. <laughs> Do you use impasto or anything? I do. I love to play around with the texture. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think even that board is, is pretty textured even mm. just underneath the paint. Um, but yes, when when things pop out, I like to actually make them pop out. Uh, very inspired by Rembrandt in that way. Mm. Yeah, there's such a tension here that I love. Um, did anyone have comments or questions? How did you decide to place the hand and the light switch above the center? Question. So I, I have done several paintings where the light switch is dead center. Um, yeah. And I wanted it to be show that she's above the darkness and yet she's about to cast everything into darkness. Mm -hmm. um, That was kind of the idea of just playing around with uh, when i was designing this composition i put it in the center and it didn't work um you know how sometimes things just work and they don't mm. work this one mm. i wanted the shadow to be falling beneath the hands and i wanted it to be be over the rest of the image mm. have you done any with the light switch like down the light switch down. I've done some without hands. I have played around with putting a person's shadow over the light switch. Um, I'm just really delving into uh, human agents we have. Mm. I thought too, you know, because I read your statement when you applied, but the idea of OCD too, you think about the person that needs to turn off the light switch a certain number of times. Like, was that something you were thinking about too? I grew up with a very OCD father who mm -hmm. I love dearly, but um, every time you left a room, your, the light had to be off. And if it wasn't, you were in mm -hmm. big trouble. Or, mm -hmm. um, thankfully, we didn't go so far as you have to turn it on and off three times. But yeah. uh, it, <laughs> light switches were actually a huge form of contention in my childhood home. Mm -hmm. And so that definitely plays into where this is coming from. Yeah, I think I, earlier I said you could felt feel the tension, but now that that makes sense. <laughs> but in in all the right ways, like it, you know, it has it has a lot of meaning for you personally, but 
others looking at it don't necessarily need to know that to to appreciate the, the tension there. And this is this is the last piece. So if anybody has questions or comments, or I, I know I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot, Freya. You are here if you wanted to talk about your piece, but if you're still here, <laughs> there you are. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, I muted myself. It took me a second. I can talk about it quickly. All right. Cool. So, so Brianna's is right next door with another source of light. <laughs> um, and this is called With Lantern Looking. Um, yeah. Um, so this is a self portrait. Um, and I'll just quickly, I paint a lot of self portraits. Um, and some of them have a story behind them and some of them don't, but this one has kind of a narrative. Um, I last year I moved from Massachusetts to Maine um, and I was supposed to move with my partner um, but unexpectedly the timing didn't work out and there was a period of time when I moved and then afterwards that I was by myself in a new apartment in a new state mm -hmm. um, and I began to convince myself that maybe the apartment was haunted um, and the apartment wasn't haunted I was just you know like anxious and by myself um and I began to realize that like I was the one haunting myself or haunting my own apartment um so that's what inspired this painting um also the movie the others as kind of a similar storyline um so thinking about that as well um and then the title is a reference to a letter written by Emily Dickinson um the line i don't remember exactly it's on my head but something i'm out with a lantern looking for myself um which sounds very like poignant and dramatic but really what she was talking about was she had moved and lost some of her stuff in the move um and then she had to go look for it and pick it up so she went out with a lantern looking for herself um and yeah i think that's what i have to say about this piece <laughs> yes I love, I love all of that. There's some, there's this eeriness, like when you say that you felt it was haunted, but um, also that feeling of being unsettled or, you know, having to relocate and grabbing for some light to maybe find others. It's really captivating. Yeah, that's also that lantern I've had for a very long time like it was in my room as a kid so there's an added layer to that it's an object that i hold dear that i've brought with me through many moves many apartments i like your color as well the way you use color the blues and reds and purples really work well thank you and and actually what's kind of it i should have after i realized this in the gallery i should have done it here but uh Peter's piece and her piece are next to each, were next to each other at the opening, and they almost looked like they played off of each other <laughs> like, <laughs> with the light. Um, it's hard to, to even describe it, but if you see my pictures on um, Instagram, you might be able to pick up on it. Um, but yeah, such, such a beautiful composition, and I'm glad you were able to, to speak to it. And um, Thank you. yeah. Any other final thoughts or questions? I did have one question for Jaina, since I wasn't really looking at her piece. Oh, sure. Um, I was wondering about that, the color yellow. Does that have any meaning at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess yellow roses are for friendship, right? And um, it was all kind of serendipitous, but it was the first time that I had asked out somebody in a long time. And so this portrait was me dealing with rejection. So it was like a friend who I'd asked out um, and they had said no. And it was, it was, yeah, it was reconciling with rejection. Huh. Okay. Wow. That brings up a whole new meaning to the piece. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> 
I know. Well, yellow's a hard yellow is a hard color to use in art. I've always mm. had difficulty with it, so it works so well there. I just thought I'd ask. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, I, it's a very overwhelming color, which I think it is. It mm. works well because I felt very overwhelmed. Mm. <laughs> yeah, good. And I love that you just made a photo shoot out of a devastating moment. <laughs> It's the only thing you can do. Only thing I can do. Yeah. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I know thank it's you. a little yeah. longer thank than you. we thought, but I'm I'm so glad that we all had a chance to to speak about the work. And um, there is another room. Um, if you walk through the door with the um, gallery um, sign, there's another room there. And also, if you guys have never been in this space, um, my gallery is not the only one. If you hit the tab um, button, you can actually see that there's a whole network of galleries in this virtual world. <laughs> uh, actually, Brendan, you want to speak or, or uh, Justin to any of that? <laughs> or are you muted? Uh, good. Thanks a lot for hosting and bringing all these artworks together and and the community around your gallery it's really nice to see everybody coming in and getting to uh connect with one another even though they might be pretty far away from each other so thank you for uh yeah doing what you do yeah well i should i guess i didn't say that brendan's the uh ceo of artgate so um yeah so and and, and justin is if he's still here um has coded much of the space we're in and um yes it is a, it's a pretty cool concept to have and be able to connect us all together from different corners <laughs> yeah we got some collectors from hong kong and europe walking through these galleries so it's wow, a nice. really wild way to be on the international stage yeah That's great and who's in yellow over there is that someone new Oh, it's Carrie. Can you hear us? Hi. I can hear you. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, I can. Hey, well, what... I left. I left oh. and came back, and now it's working. Oh, good. Okay, good. Would you guys be able to stick around to talk about Carrie's? Sure. I'll, do, I'll be quick. Okay. Be quick. She's over here. Okay. All right. Uh, my piece is a. Here we go. It's over here. <laughs> Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, Carrie. Uh, can you walk over with your keyboard keys to the piece? Uh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. then we can hear you because we you have to get closer. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, All right. Well, it's, I'm learning. It's like um, if we were in a real room and you had to get a little closer so we could hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, she's very. Um, self-directed uh, young woman and is dealing with um, some relatives moving to other parts of the country and she's very independent. Um, I wanted to capture that in the portrait, but I also um, am using painting on mylar, which is translucent. So there is um, fabric underneath the painting. Uh, I got it at Joanne's, but it's from India or Africa. And then in the upper right corner is a my own painting of icicles that I cut out and attached. <laughs> and I was trying to bring up the warm colors of the fabric versus the cold icicles to show the two cultures that this young woman has had to integrate into her young life. And she's done a marvelous job. Uh, the mylar also is non-absorbent, so you will see drips there. And I like the element of chance in my current paintings because I feel that um, life is not about control. It's about some control and some chance and how you handle both. So I used to be very controlled and very tight. So I'm getting away from that. Um, anyway, so, and then there is an earring in it too. So I, it's a, I got some elements of collage and I was inspired by, De um, when I met Danielle and I loved her work too that uses uh, fabric. 
And thank you, Danielle, for uh, you know curating this marvelous show. Absolutely. Yeah, if you guys get up close, you can see that the earring is real. <laughs> It is it's such a fabulous piece, and it, it, I have it hung in the uh, window, and it changes depending on the time of day and the uh, cloud coverage. <laughs> but it's, oh, yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah, it's kind of an added um, narrative almost. Well, that's trans translucency and the lay. I'm interested in layering, too. Mm. So that's a big part of it. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad you got your mic and uh, speaker set up. I and we're Not able sure to how it works, but finally it is. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. Yes. Well, well, I enjoyed everybody else's explanations. Oh, good. Did anyone have any uh, quick questions or, or comments? I really like the way the, uh, the material comes through uh, from behind. It's really lovely how that happens with the mylar. Never thought about painting on mylar. It's a good idea. Thank you. It's fun to paint. It feels like ice skating. I mean, you're just <laughs> yeah, well, drawing on it is the same. Yeah. yeah. And it's from life, so I had to work fast. So mylar allows allows one to work very fast. Is it oil or a Oh, it is oil, yeah. Mm. And does it dry differently on mylar than on canvas? No, I don't go really thickly, um, yeah. but it dries, it dries in three or four days, like regular oils. Yeah. Good question. It's really nice. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming out tonight. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And you saw how easy it was to jump in here. So. Give it a whirl sometime and you can uh, always find some new interesting artwork around um and thank you so much well thank you very much danielle yes. thank you danielle for all your help yeah you got it all right nice, nice well, to meet everybody good night yes. all right see you on night. yeah and i'll i'll post this on youtube too and i'll let you guys know when it's ready that would be great. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.